I promised offline that I will not uh, uh, argue anymore. Yeah, I yeah. made him. I made him swear, guys. I just threatened him with my dusty knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call you Dusty Knuckle Chug. <laughs> Yeah, but um, but yeah, that's good. How are things on your side? How's um, Amsterdam? Getting to know it and finding out. Uh, the, yeah, it's the best man. spots and stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Amsterdam right now, and you're never gonna really? see me in North America again. <laughs> I'm just staying here. <laughs> I'll just overstay my visa, but if I never leave, they'll never know. So it's okay. You know, everyone speaks English. I don't have to speak a word of Dutch. I haven't even yeah, tried. Yeah. Which uh, <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, what what is struck me as kind of an assholeish thing to do is show up somewhere and not even try and speak a yeah. word of their language. But I, yeah, this time I didn't even try. Yeah, I mean that was what I did in Japan. I like spent a weekend trying to learn basic Japanese, and then I just learned like Google Translate and yeah, like, Google yeah. Lens, and that was so much easier. So much. But I mean, easier. Japanese um, is hard, super yeah, hard, yeah. especially for an English speaker, right? Whereas Dutch, I mean, you know, if one wanted to, you could probably. Do you think it it's even like? Do you think it's even worth putting your kids in bilingual school now that in 10 years we'll all have a babblefish in our ear? Oh, man. Yeah, I I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if it was worth it for me. Yeah, because so, you did French immersion. So, right? Yeah, so I did French immersion. And it is cool to be able to speak another language. And it mm-hmm. gives you some sort of cultural touchstone with people who are speaking their second language to you always. So mm-hmm. like in Europe, mostly, you know, if people are speaking English, it's mostly their second language, at least. Mm-hmm. And so it gives you some sort of reference point for like what, what that must be like, uh, mm-hmm. especially if they're not entirely fluent yet. But honestly, I'm not sure if I buy the arguments that it, you know, makes you smarter or expands your mind or <laughs> does, yeah. it has any of these uh, excellent cognitive uh, consequences, you know, uh, yeah, as opposed to just being able to actually speak the language. So, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know what to make of it. Uh, people ask me all the time, like, whether it was worth it to do French immersion. And one thing I point out to them is that French immersion is not what you think it is, meaning that most people don't come out of French immersion, even if they do it grade one through grade 12 and are able to speak French very well at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you're in like picking up a language really depends on your social mi- milieu and having mm-hmm. to speak it for being forced to speak it in social situations. Right. That's really how you learn the language. But Mm -hmm. in French immersion, by construction, you're only speaking it in classes formally in front of your teachers. And because everyone else is first language is English, when you go outside for recess, then you speak English with all your friends. Right. And so you're really getting very little uh, face time Mm. with people who are like really speaking French to you. Right. Mm. And so. There's a reason why people come out of French immersion and they still sound, you know, they're still stuttering. If you put them in the middle Mm -hmm. of Quebec or France, they stick out like a sore thumb, etc. So my French got, it was at its peak when after high school, I spent some time living in just like a little town in Quebec. And then that's when it was at its height. And then it's just slowly decreased (laughs) since then. So do you think, Uh, is it gone? Because Helena took French immersion too. And she, like if we were to go to France or something and be immersed in the culture, I think it would come back a little bit. But right now, she basically doesn't have it anymore. Um, mm, and like, really? could you speak? Could you speak fluently if you um, were? Uh, yeah, fluently would be a stretch. So like, a, a French, like a Quebecois, would be able to tell pretty quickly that I wasn't Quebecois. Uh, yeah. But I think I could hold the conversation in most arenas, aside from stuff that's very culturally of the moment when I just wouldn't know some of the verbiage and stuff. Okay, sorry, what you said just like reminded me of something. So I heard something somewhere that I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm just wondering if you've heard it as well, that people say that kids pick up second languages more quickly. But I thought I heard somewhere that it's not necessarily the case that kids pick up second languages more quickly. It's just that if you're in an environment where you will literally starve and none of your needs will get met, um, like being a child, then you mm-hmm. have to speak the language <laughs> and you'll have to learn it. And so it's more that adults just are able to take care of themselves competently without having this other language and thus don't need to exert as much effort into uh, into learning it. 
Does, yeah. Have you heard that or am I making this up? Yeah, I have heard that. I think that's a bit of cope from, from the adults in the room, to be honest. What, wait, what is copes? I've heard, wait, copes is a new word that I've been hearing everywhere. How do you, how did you use that and what does it mean? Like co- cognitively cope with the situation in order. Like you hear news you don't want to hear, you hear a fact you don't want to hear, and, and then you come up with some reason to... All the kids are yeah. using it these days. And I know, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel so trendy right now. So <laughs> yeah. I'm a young man on the podcast. Let's <laughs> yeah. go. Bit of cope. Sorry to interrupt you, um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think there's two things worth separating. One is like your palate and the development of your palate. And so I think it's undoubtedly easier for kids to learn accents uh, mm. earlier on, right? So let's say in principle, it's, it's as easy for a child and adult to actually learn the syntax, the vocabulary of the of the language. But I think that the kid will still sound more natural. Yeah. And then secondly, is just actual language acquisition, understanding mm-hmm. and, uh, and being able to speak the language. Yeah, so I don't know about that second one. You know, I think the common wisdom is that it's harder for adults to do it. I don't know if how people, I don't even know how you'd study that, to be honest, because you'd have to make sure somehow like the incentives are the same to control for mm-hmm. these sort of situations yeah. you're you're describing. And uh, And there's also this effect where like if people always say, oh, the more languages you know, the easier it is to pick up a next language, right? And then adults, you know, maybe if you know three languages as a kid, then as an adult, yeah, you can pick up a fourth. But obviously the big confounding effect there is just if you're the type of person who likes to learn languages then yeah obviously continuing on into your life it might just be that you enjoy and are good at picking up languages um so you can't even look at that sort of thing so uh, yeah i don't know that's the short answer yeah well and then obviously like very young kids have like the language instinct or whatever and so they obviously are preternaturally disposed to picking up language at an early age but i'm wondering when that tapers off like seven, yep. eight, nine year old kids compared to 17 year olds or 27 year olds, if put in circumstances where they have to speak, otherwise they're not going to make friends because they're in a new city and no one speaks Spanish and thus you have to learn English and say, yep. it'd be interesting to, com- to compare, like to see when it peters off. But anyway, what do you think? Should we get into it? So yeah, welcome. <laughs> 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 That was too squeaky. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's welcome staying back. In there. Yeah. That's staying in for sure. Uh, welcome back to Increments. My name is Veda Masrani. I'm a senior research scientist in machine learning. And Mr. Amsterdam himself, Mr. Benny Dusty Knuckles Chug. There he is. <laughs> I don't the know what man. that means. That sounds like an old person saying, but I'll just No, I lie. think it's just because you're like fighting and kicking ass all day. And so your knuckles oh, are, nice. are bruised from all of the, uh, the ass kicking you've been doing. I appreciate your confidence in me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So blah, 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 podcast stuff. Uh, we're on Patreon. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. We're on Discord. Send us an email to get in. Uh, we are dying in terms of reviews. I think someone gave us a one-star review. Do you know? That? <laughs> someone gave us a one-star review. But we got yeah. some nice... Uh, or ratings. They gave us a one-star rating. Yeah. But we got some nice reviews, some textual reviews. So oh, that's okay. nice. Yeah, so yeah. keep keep yeah. that coming. We need to, we need more of that. Unless they're bad, then, then keep that shit away from us. Reflect on yourself if you feel like you have some <laughs> negative things to say. So we're continuing with uh, Chapter 19, uh, Part 2. Uh, I think we only made it like 20 or 30% in. That's generous. So I won't try to summarize what we said last time, uh, but just briefly, if you are tuning in, probably listen to the first episode before you listen to this one. That being said, the large theme of this chapter is optimism and looking back through the history of essentially the Commonwealth nations in particular. Um, And what partially what Popper's reconciling is how can he call himself an optimist while also not believing in laws of history, trends, mm. in- inevitable future progress, etc. We got into a heated argument last time. I don't <laughs> entirely remember what it was about, but um, but perhaps you want to say any thoughts there, and then we can kick things off. Maybe I'll just recap the first thesis, because I think that's as far as we made it, and then we can jump to the second thesis. But the first thesis will perhaps rekindle our argument somewhat, and, and perhaps I'll just summarize it. I promised offline that I will not... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I made him. Yeah. I made him swear, guys. I threatened him with my dusty knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call you Dusty Knuckle Chug. <laughs> All right. So Popper's. Um, so Popper's first thesis is arguing against the Russellian thesis, if you accept that as a word, like Bertrand Russell. 
Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I should have yeah, actually yeah, clarified yeah. What the hell I meant there. Um, that humans are clever and wicked. And Popper disputes this by saying, my first thesis is this. We are good, perhaps a little too good, but we are also a little stupid. And it's this mixture of goodness and stupidity, which lies at the root of our troubles. I, we, I think we both broadly agree with Popper here. And I think this is an important insight. And I think actually an insight that most people have day to day about other people once you realize that no one is or very rarely people are waking up in the morning uh, tempting to do bad. Most people are convinced in some way or another that what they're doing is good for the world or good for their community. I think you and I had a disagreement over the extent to which certain social incentives and pressures can enable you to act in ways that you think are against the common self-interest. Uh, I want to say that Popper has a huge insight here, but isn't entirely correct and is uh, not taking seriously the incentive to be part of an in-group, say. And even if you know that that in-group is or you don't agree with sort of the actions or the stances taken by that in-group, uh, the desire to be part of an in-group can uh, erode uh, or can make you act in ways that you think are perhaps not for the good of everyone. Mm -hmm. So I think the disagreement is just over the extent to which so social incentives uh, can rule our actions. Yeah, like, I, yeah, I was thinking a little bit about it and like, think what I was pushing back on last time. Just kind of like a confusion about levels, I guess. I feel like goodness and cleverness are just at a more fundamental level than, yeah, signaling and incentives. But that's, it's kind of just like a separate subject from my perspective. Um, and so that would be my thesis statement there. But we promised we wouldn't argue. But <laughs> no, let's not. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. just get into the whole thing. We'll just end up repeating ourselves from last time. I Because I think we're also going to disagree about this second thesis. So we better hold <laughs> the arguments okay, okay. in reserve here. <laughs> okay, it's going to be okay. a chaotic episode. Although I'm more, I think I'm more amenable to being disputed on the second thesis so yeah, okay. let's let's yeah so let's maybe just jump right into it so how do we get from the first thesis to his comments about self-determination um and what does he say about self-determination and why in the previous episode did i say i was like completely blown away by this section and found it to be one of the most interesting things from popper i've read in a long time um bertrand russell says the main problem of our time is that we are really clever but we're evil. We have bad intentions. Popper then says, no, 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 hold on a second. It's not that we are clever and wicked, it's that we're dumb and good. And then Popper realizes, or he says, well, okay, um, like the biggest retort to his claim is Hitler and Stalin, essentially. <laughs> um, so he says, like, how could someone like myself possibly make the claim that we have too much morality when we've just seen the concentration camps and um, we know about Stalin's um, gulag. So that's how he dives into the Stalin and Hitler um, discussion. Okay, yeah, so um, I'll read two paragraphs here. And um, the first paragraph is essentially squaring the circle of his thesis with the existence of communism. He says, so the absurdity of the communist faith is manifest, it's obvious. Uh, appealing to the belief in human freedom it has produced a system of oppression without parallel in history. Then he turns to Hitler. Uh, but the nationalist faith is equally absurd. And then this is the part that blew me over. So he's not alluding here to Hitler's racial myth. Uh, that's almost like too easy of a target. It's obvious that the belief in Aryan superiority is, is insane and evil. But what he's actually going to attack is the UN charter is what he's attacking. What he's actually going to attack is the UN charter. The UN talks about the right of a nation to self-determination. Um, and so he is going to attack Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and the ideas that led to uh, essentially the, the wave of decolonialism across the 20th century. Um, and that is striking. Um, and when I first read this paragraph, I wasn't sure why he was coming out so strongly against the alleged right of a nation to self-determination. And it's because he's attacking essentially what we all take to be a human right. Um, and why he's coming out so strongly against it is he's attacking something that is so fundamental that I have never even thought to criticize it. I have never heard anyone criticize the UN Charter. Uh, let me pause there. No, that's great. I basically think you should keep going. I'm glad I did understand 
exactly what he was attacking because I was a little worried that I was I was a little worried I guess that he was either defining the self determinant of nations in a way I was unfamiliar with or if his if he seemed to be attacking something like Wilson's 14 point plan or what we all yeah. in the modern world would conceive of as a nation's right to self determination which is basically just the right of a group of people who conceive of themselves as a nation to decide their own destiny maybe yeah. in the international order so anyway i i guess i'm glad to hear that i was not wrong i i i wasn't persuaded by popper reading mm. this part so i'm excited to see why you were and then we can mm. chat about it so basically yeah i think you should just keep going so here's what he says Uh, So what I have in mind, rather, is an alleged natural right of man, the alleged right of the nation to self-determination. For the utter absurdity of the principle of national self-determination must be plain to anyone who devotes a moment's effort to criticize it. The principle amounts to the demand that each state should be a nation state, that it should be confined within a natural border, and that this border should coincide with the location of an ethnic group. So that it should be the ethnic group, quote, the nation, which should determine and protect the natural limits of the state. So why I found this paragraph hard to parse when I first read it is that um, I didn't have a deep familiarity with the difference between nation and state here. Um, So a nation is essentially defined as a group of people with a shared cultural and linguistic and ethnic background. And a state is what we all think about a, a, a state. So his claim is basically that If this is taken seriously, any group of people who claim that they are a nation, such as Quebecois in Canada, or people from Catalonia in Spain, or the Jews, or the Palestinians, or the uh, basically any group of people at all should create a country and a walled garden and an army and a border. And I just want to read a quote from uh, The Open Society and Its Enemies just to give a bit of um, background context for this, and then I'll pause and, and see what your, your, your reflections are. How anyone who had the slightest knowledge of European history, of the shifting and mixing of all kinds of tribes, of the countless waves of people who have come forth from their original Asian habitat and split up and mingled when reaching the maze of peninsulas called the European continent, how anyone who knew this could ever have put forward such an inapplicable principle is hard to understand. Um, And so I think it's worth reflecting on the difference between, let's say, Zionism, which claims that the Jews, because they are a nation and an ethnicity, should have their own state. Let's compare that to how people are living in Canada and the United States. So in Canada and the United States, there are all sorts of different people. There's, There's Indians, there's people from Quebec, there's Irish. There are essentially a fractal number of different groups and possible ethnic uh, tribes. But all people are living not as a nation state, but living as United States. And so what the alleged right of a nation to self-determination means, the principle amounts to the demand that each state should be a nation state. We should have a nation for the Gujaratis, a nation for the people from Quebec, a nation for Albertans. Why not define Albertans as an ethnicity? And there should be armies for each ethnicity. Um, And each ethnicity should have borders and security and international relations. Um, Rather than people living harmoniously with one another, every subgroup should have its own army. Um, That's what his claim is. That's what he's attacking. And that's why I found it so fascinating. Okay, good, good, good. So there are some things I like here and some things I don't like. What I do like is pointing out the absurdity that the international order should have to respect the wishes of any arbitrary uh, group of people or ethnic group that says, we now want to have our own government, right? So if there is a nation composed of, you know, 17 different ethnic groups, say, and one of them says, now this is our territory and we want to define define our own country on this land, everyone else uh, get out of here that that is going to cause some serious geopolitical disturbances and it would be absurd to build a world order around respecting those sorts of, dare I say, sort of arbitrary rights. What I don't agree with is his assumption that this applies to ethnic groups only. So I was reading a bit about, uh, you know, the history of Wilson's thought 
um, Woodrow Wilson uh, when he was laying out his 14 points. And I believe there, he when he was outlining uh, what came to be the right of self-determination to a nation, he had in mind something like, as one example, the American Revolution, right? And so that is Popper's, so you you seem to be using that as um, like a reductio ad absurdum of like, this is precisely not what Popper meant. Um, and people could sort of destroy the United States of America if we took this principle too far, because any ethnic group within the US could define their own state. But if you look at, so I, I had looked at the definition of self-determination of a nation from Cornell Law School. I didn't do it from the UN, so mm-hmm. I, I can't remember the exact wording you used. But Cornell Law School just says it's the legal right of a people to decide their own yeah. destiny. And a people is culturally, it's, it's, that's context dependent. If, if you view the formation of something like the US or colonies throwing off the hegemony of their colonizers, then I totally support the right of a nation to self-determination. Mm. It's, a, it's a group of people regardless of whether they share an ethnicity or not, deciding that they want to take, like I said earlier, sort of the destiny in, into their own hands, right? And so mm-hmm. I don't like that Popper automatically identifies nation with ethnic group, I guess is a <laughs> shorter way to put my long-winded objection. And yeah, so maybe just give me your reflections on that. Well, so here's, so he talks about this. So here's what he says about um, Britain and the United States. Moreover, Britain, the United States, Canada, and Switzerland are four obvious examples of states which in many ways violate the nationality principle. Instead of having its borders determined by one settled group, each of them has managed to unite a variety of ethnic groups. And so all of the difficulties come in the, in the word people, right? How do you define a group of people before countries exist? But that's why I want to say that's context dependent and is, for, for instance, obvious in the case of the, U- the American Revolution, which had people from a variety of, of different backgrounds. And and to define it only in terms of an ethnic group seems to be short sighted. But this is the definition of a nation state compared to United States. So a nation state, and we're talking about nationalism. A nation state is the defining of a state as protecting a particular ethnic group. Right. So the debate is 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 self determination about Popper's conception only of the nation state here, or is it more broadly about just the right of a people? to define their own uh, destiny in the inter- international order. And I claim, I think it's the second, but we'd have to resolve this with a, a legal scholar. So um, what is the alternative? I think we need to talk about the alternative. Otherwise, it's hard to um, compare, right? So um, I'm just, I'll read some more um, from, from the text. <laughs> We're going to need a part three for this. <laughs> yeah. Chapter. Nation states of this kind do not exist. Even Iceland, the only exception I can think of, is only an apparent exception to this rule. For its limits are determined not by its ethnic group, but by the North Atlantic, just as they are protected not by the Icelandic nation, but by the North Atlantic Treaty. Nation states do not exist simply because so-called nations or peoples of which the nationalists dream do not exist. So use your word peoples. Um, There are no or hardly any homogenous ethnic groups long settled in countries with natural borders. Ethnic and linguistic groups um, are closely intermingled everywhere. Uh, Masarak's Czechoslovakia was founded upon the principle of national self-determination, but as soon as it was founded, the Slovaks demanded in the name of this same principle to be free from Czech Czech domination. And ultimately, it was destroyed by its German minority in the name of the very same principle. Similar situations have arisen in practically every case in which the principle of national self-determination has been applied to fixing the borders of a new state in Ireland, in India, in Israel, in Yugoslavia. But what's the alternative? So here's the alternative. Um, There are ethnic minorities everywhere. The proper aim cannot be to liberate all of them. Rather, it must be to protect all of them. The oppression of national groups is a great evil, but national self-determination is not a feasible remedy. So I claim something like, we could have accomplished decolonialism not by using this idea of self-determination, but by using this idea of protecting minorities. And so to the extent that the British or the European countries were actively harming ethnic minorities, then that is a 
great enough reason to do away with colonialism. We do not need to um, have this idea of self-determination precisely because what we define to be a peoples is intrinsically fractal in nature. Um, anybody can define themselves to be a peoples and anyone can claim national self-determination for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And back to your point about you not being prepared to say all these movements are wrong. Neither am I. I am not saying that all of these movements are necessarily wrong. Um, I think that there are certainly great reasons, for example, for the Indians to have kicked out the, the British. Um, I don't know enough about, say, Catalan separatism, but I do know a bit about Quebec separatism. And I think that it's pretty insane to think that Quebec can just be a nation embedded inside of Canada. And to the extent that there are ethnic minorities who are being oppressed or mistreated, then absolutely that's a problem. But I don't think the remedy, as Popper says, is um, national self-determination. I, I, I think it's it's doing away with mistreatment of ethnic minorities by ethnic majorities. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I'm going to stop trying to defend my ethnic group point because obviously I'm not doing it very well. But let me just agree with Popper maybe that once you take this to its logical limit and you would just allow any arbitrary group of people under whatever circumstances they wish to define themselves as their own state, then that's clearly a reductio ad absurdum. And or you get define themselves as their own there. people and then demand their own state. So that's that's how it works. So they define themselves as an ethnic group, an ethnic people, and then they use this principle to uh, request and demand and fight for and commit violence in the name of a state. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I guess I'm not prepared to sign off on that. I don't know enough about international law to be able to say that as invoked, the uh, self-determination must appeal to an ethnic group. I guess that's, that's the entire point of what I'm disputing. So on the Wikipedia page for nationalism, it, nationalism is an idea and movement that holds that the nation, so I'm clicking on nation now, and how do they define nation? A nation is a large type of social organization where a collective identity and national identity has emerged from a combination of shared features across a given population, such as language, history, ethnicity, culture, territory, or society. Yes, such as. <laughs> exactly. So not exclusive to. But this is what Popper's saying, right? So when you just, if you use the word a peoples, then this is nationalism. Like we're not talking about human beings. We're talking about a group of people who share some feature, such as ethnic, ethnicity, language, or history. Um, and that's what like, like, like what, uh, what good do you see of this definition? I see nothing but bad. Um, I see it's a way to separate and isolate and draw distinctions between. Yeah. And my entire question is, is self-determination actually relying on this definition of ethnicity as you keep coming back to, which I'm clearly not getting across, but I'm uh, still no, not no, seeing no. a clear the answer. Nation, to the nation, the nation, the, the, the definition of a nation is, um, and so they're saying that a nation has a right to self-determination. Yeah, no. So self the first line on Wikipedia, self-determination refers to a people's right to form its own political entity. And internal self-determination is the right to representative government with full suffrage. That has There's no de notion of nation peoples, in there. Peoples. 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 Yeah, peoples. exactly. And peoples. peoples. <laughs> um, and people is any just plurality of persons considered as a whole. No, Nathan, no nation, no ethnicity, etc. So, so I obviously am not versed enough in international law to be able to litigate this dispute but i claim that neither are you and popper could be just wrong here he's relying a lot on this notion of people as being defined solely by a shared ethnic identity and i agree that insofar as that's true then this this right has issues uh, obvious issues that go along with it that I think he's right to point out. But insofar as he's wrong, uh, I, could I, I can see it still being a useful principle. And in fact, the principle can be used to support independence movements such as of the U.S. Of a, as a whole and Canada as a whole. Well, I don't think that the U.S. was... Oh, that's a historical point, which... I no, no, but this is just... Um, the, I'm, I'm saying, no, it, it wasn't based on that, but this is the kind of thing Woodrow Wilson had in mind. Woodrow Wilson, I've seen it claimed in at least one source, had something like... Uh, the formation of the United States, w when he started defining uh, what would eventually end up in the UN Charter as the right of a nation to self-determination. So this is an example I claim that he had in the back of his head. So he was not solely thinking of ethnic groups uh, defining themselves as their sure, own nation. Sure. Um, and that would cut directly against Popper's thesis. 
Uh, but World War II and the history of nationalism would not like. So I guess we're just arguing about if Popper is right about this, and I, I will go to bat that he absolutely is because when I think about nationalism, I think about like race hatred, and I think about ethnic tribalism and all of this stuff. Um, and this kind of starts from the philosophies in the 1700s, and it goes well through Hegel, and like it's it, it's not an accident that the National Socialists were very very focused on race <laughs> like the relationship between nations peoples races ethnicities and histories and historicism is all tied together here um and you're kind of using a modern 21st century lens and you're thinking about the nation of the united states uh, where you can have nations that aren't really about nationalism so much right is, is that your main yeah um, that's exactly point? right yeah, yeah. yeah. i've already um, said in so far as that's wrong i agree with popper so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so essentially i I would be shocked if he got that part factually wrong. <laughs> like that's a very central thing that he's saying, and he talks about it extensively in uh, Open Society. But well, anyway. he seems to have gotten some stuff factually wrong, <laughs> and also in his next part about about war and stuff. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't oh, be that surprised oh, if he got stuff factually wrong. So what? It oh no, we'll get to it in his like third and fourth theses. He just seems to be confused about some of the history of war. Oh, brilliant. Okay, well, shall we keep keep moving? Shall we leave the national? Yeah, let's, Self-determination uh, let's subject aside. Actually, no, maybe I'll just read this to conclude um, this, this discussion. And then uh, that's how he kind of concludes it too. So he says, the nationalist religion is strong. Many are ready to die for it, fervently believing, believing that it's morally good and factually true. But they are mistaken, just as mistaken as their communist bedfellows. Few creeds have created more hatred, cruelty, and senseless suffering than the belief in the righteousness of the nationality principle. And yet it is still widely believed that this principle will help to alleviate the misery of national oppression. And with that, I pass it back to you. Yeah, okay. So his second thesis is basically the original Pinker style thesis. And he says, in spite of our great and serious troubles, and in spite of the fact that ours is surely not the best possible society, I assert that our own free world is by far the best society which has come into an existence during the course of human history. And so he's here he's not actually focused on material abundance, um, although he is impressed and awed by the, the progress we've made to be able to curtail poverty and hunger. And presumably, he'd be awed by the progress we've continued to make on those problems since 1956, more than 60 years later. But what he's referring to mostly here are ethics and values. Uh, so he says, I have in mind the standards and values which have come down to us through Christianity from, from Greece and from the Holy Land, from Socrates and from the Old and New Testaments. So, yeah, Popper is maybe taking part in a debate that has some modern relevance here about how important uh, Christianity has been for the formation of Western ethics. Uh, and hmm. I maybe found his opinion here somewhat surprising. The historical legacy through Christianity, I wasn't seeing him make a case that it was directly because of Christianity, as much as just historically that's what seemed to have happened. No, I don't know. He just has the one line about it. But I think the causality is pretty clear based on what he says, right? The standards and values which come down to us through Christianity. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, he might just mean it's historical happenstance or something but i view him basically as saying christianity was at least in part responsible for the kinds of ethics that we're choosing to enshrine into laws today yeah did he give any examples of that um i i haven't listened to as many like christian nationalists as i should to like know <laughs> thy enemy but um well, i think they'd looked at things like the ten of commandments and stuff right so i i mean there's there's definitely a, a broad coalition of people now who think that most of Western ethics comes down to us through Christianity. Uh, I'm thinking of people like Ben Shapiro and stuff, right, who think it's impossible yeah. to develop yeah. a secular notion of ethics that is coherent and think that all such secularists, secularists are just secretly relying on stuff yeah. like Christian values underneath. Um, but there's the obvious point that you need to read what you want to out of the Bible because it's a, a much less political text than, say, the Quran. Yeah. So it's like it, it, when you're... Yeah when you're taking ethics out of the bible and something you're already interposing a certain reading a certain ethical reading onto the bible so that yeah, that would be my claim yeah like uh, popper hasn't written too much about christianity but that is rather suspect because mm. as far as i can tell he hasn't 
come out critical of religion, even though all of his philosophy, all of his falsifiability stuff, like all of it could de- directly attack um, Christianity. Uh, but he has spoken very um, favorably of uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, who definitely has attacked Christianity in his book, um, Why, I'm an, Why I Am Not a Christian, for instance. Um, so in insofar as he has lent support to other philosophers who have attacked Christianity, um, I think it's fair to guess that he's thought about it, but he just hasn't, uh, I think it's just like a choosing your battles kind of, kind of thing. Like right. in a similar way that he, um, like with the whole rights of a nation to self-determination, like he could have been much more inflammatory and, and talk about the UN and put in all these keywords that would have just got people's backs up. But yeah. he like strategically didn't do that. He didn't mention the word colonialism, for example, that's nowhere in this essay. Mm-hmm. He doesn't talk about the UN. I don't even know if he mentions Wilson in this particular essay, but he's kind of like strategically not triggering his readers i think um yeah, yeah. by avoiding it's a things, refreshing but, uh, tactic so yeah let me just read one more quote here which i thought was yeah was kind of adorable but also insightful yeah. he says yeah. before but before examining these facts more closely uh the facts here he he's he's about to list some facts of things that he thinks have gotten better over time so he says but before examining these facts more closely i wish to stress that i'm very much alive to other facts also power still corrupts even in our world civil servants still behave at times like uncivil masters that's such a good line yeah pocket dictators still abound and a normally intelligent man seeking medical advice must be prepared to be treated as a rather tiresome type of imbecile if he betrays <laughs> an intelligent interest that is a critical interest in his physical condition yeah. so you I just know like he's writing this like you know this amazing the day after regardless he's of whether off his you, doctor yeah, <laughs> Yeah. He's like talking about all these international affairs and, you know, the broad history of our time, the sweep of yeah. optimi- optimism, the progress of the yeah. of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. And then he has to put this little jab yeah. in at what was undoubtedly like yeah, a doctor's visit a week ago. And he's like, yeah. all I was trying to do was ask you a question, you fucking imbecile. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. exactly. I just thought it was I, so adorable. Yeah, oh, so God. fuck. So good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, so let me just list things that he thinks have gotten better, which will be familiar uh, to many listeners of this podcast. And he lists poverty, unemployment, and some similar forms of social insecurity, sickness and pain, penal cruelty, <laughs> penal cruelty, cruelty, slavery, and other forms of serfdom, religious and racial discrimination, lack of educational opportunities, rigid class differences, and war. Uh, and so those are quite indisputable still to today. We haven't, uh, regressed on many of them. Possibly class differences is the one that I think is arguably, uh, has reverted to some extent, presumably not reverted to how it was, uh, right before Popper was speaking, but has, has perhaps reverted somewhat in the last 20 years or so. Uh, but other than that, most of the other ones, aside from war, which is pro- perhaps the big, uh, Damocles sword or the obvious point to raise, uh, especially in the last couple of years here. Uh, but most of these we've continued to make much progress on. Uh, and that brings us to his third thesis, which is war. Nice. Okay. So war is obviously on everyone's mind these days. Uh, mm-hmm. And so his third thesis is specifically tackling this issue, and it's the relation of progress to war. So quoting once again, he says, my third thesis is that since the time of the Boer War, None of the democratic governments of the free world has been in a position to wage a war of aggression. No democratic government would be united upon the issue because they would not have the nation united behind them. Aggressive war has become almost a moral impossibility. So just to remind people, the Boer War was, uh, I think, 1899 to 1902 or something. And okay, I should have written this down, but it was the British, I believe, invading South Africa to mm-hmm. maintain a hold, uh, basically to, to, to prop up and support the apartheid regime, mm-hmm. uh, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was a fairly bloody affair, and uh, many South Africans were killed, and many British were killed as well. And it sort of backfired in terms of public relations, in that I think afterwards the people of Britain were pretty disgusted by what they viewed as to be un- unethical actions taken by the, the government. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was one of the first instances of sort of anti-war protests that we're now quite familiar with. And Popper is basically looking at this as a good thing, saying, uh, you know, now people are not content to be led by a government that is going into other countries and uh, 
and killing people and waging these sort of war of aggressions, especially if it is to uh, cement a hold on their empire, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And so he views this war war as a tragic event, but maybe had these positive consequences in that they permanently disrupted the people's tastes for war. Uh, And so... Again, like I, yeah, I just feel like I'm being so contrary this whole this whole episode. Um, I don't think it's worth dwelling too much on my criticisms of this part. I think he's largely correct. Again, I think he's just historically a little mistaken that there hasn't been any sort of war of aggression since the Boer War. Um, by and by so, democracies and the- by democracy, yeah. So I'm thinking of like there was the Anglo-Iraqi War. Of 1941, English invaded Iraq. Hmm. I didn't know about that. There was the Franco-Syrian War, where the uh, the Syrians were revolting because they were promised an independent Arab state during the First World War, and then the French invaded them because the French were promised hold over the Syrian states by the by the uh, San Remo Conference mandates. Greece invaded Turkey, I believe, after World War One. Uh, there was some, you know, and then there's like the question of interventions to what extent or mm. is intervening in certain wars considered wars of aggression. That's arguable mm. for sure. But, you know, like the Americans, you know, many of the Western countries inv- it were involved, for instance, in like the Russian Civil War. Uh, there was American intervention in the Mexican Revolution. So, you know, those ones are more debatable. I think the Anglo-Iraqi War and the Franco-Syrian War mm. are less debatable. Uh, many mm. people would say, especially the Anglo-Iraqi War. Um, I mean, I would argue that was a necessary war. Um, the <laughs> Iraqi, the, the, so Iraq had been taken over in a coup by Rashid Ali, who was a, a pro-Nazi sympathizer, and that's what basically mm-hmm. kicked off the Anglo-Iraqi war. So you can you can definitely argue these words are justified, but they're still wars of aggression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. so I think w- w- what they highlight is wars of aggression can totally be supported by the people if the people <laughs> believe the cause is righteous. Uh, and so. And, you know, I think we're still seeing this today to some extent. So maybe maybe let me try and synthesize Popper's thesis and say, I think it's harder to wage a clearly unjust war if you are if a country or a government is trying to wage war simply to, for instance, uh, gather more resources or expand their territorial control or something. I think that's hard to do. But if you are able to convince your people um, that it's for some sort of righteous cause and is necessary, then I think there are totally examples. And these are examples from b- before Popper had written. So this, you know, this doesn't cut. Uh, 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 it's not as if they hadn't happened by 1956 or something. Um, and I think, in fact, these counterexamples serve to highlight one of his points in the first thesis, which is that people can be easily led by the nose. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's for a good cause, sometimes it's not. But his whole thing was that people are good. Um, and this causes us to be led by the nose by charismatic mm-hmm. leaders sometimes. And that's totally consistent with people being led by the nose into into wars. Yeah, I, um, I hadn't heard of the Anglo-Iraqi war, so I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, I just looked up the Wikipedia page and it looks like it's part of World War II. Well, yeah, but it's, I mean, sure. So if, I if mean, you're viewing that, if you're viewing Britain's involvement in World War II as not an act of aggression, but a response to the spread of fascism, then I think it would still be counted as, as not an act of aggression. I mean, they but, evaded Iraq. But, if, you don't, if you don't want to define that as a war of aggression, then it's unclear what war of aggression is. just means. part of the World War II, but point, point taken, let's not, let's not quibble. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, no, no, yeah, point taken. I, I think like it's, um, you can point out maybe some, some edge cases, but it's undoubtedly true that democratic countries don't fight each other to <laughs> the same extent that non-democratic countries uh, do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, for sure. For but, sure. Uh, but nice. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of the Anglo-Iraqi war, so that's awesome. Yeah, we're we're moving along. This is this is nice. Uh, this brings us to the next thing he talks about, which is part- perhaps particularly fitting for this episode because I feel like I've just been accusing Popper of <laughs> missing certain things here and there, even though I largely agree with him. Um, and then, so I can imagine turning around, Popper turning around to me and saying, "This accusation that you're leveling leveling against me is part of sort of this broader theme of self." accusation that is a yeah. unique feature of western societies which yeah, this is so uh, appropriate for the time which is extremely <laughs> appropriate and modern commentators have certainly made these sort of points especially in regards to wokeism where uh mm-hmm. it's especially prominent these days uh 
you know, for people on the far left to be extremely critical of the U.S. in particular, you know, you'll hear a lot about the hegemony of the U.S. and the U.S. empire and and all this stuff. Um, and what's funny is the U.S. and the West in general consist of countries where uh, you can get away with criticizing your government uh, and marching in the streets against government action and and not have to worry that your life be threatened because of it and not be worried that mm-hmm. you're going to throw be thrown in jail in other countries even though you might like to go on marches and tell your government that you don't agree with what they're doing people are scared for their lives <laughs> to do so and so popper basically views our ability to criticize our government here as a unique and important and good feature of mm-hmm. uh, the, the the atlantic community uh mm-hmm. so there's a long quote i could read here Oh, you! Uh, if you're not going to read it, I'm going to read it. I love this okay. quote so much. So you have no, definitely read <laughs> Go it. Go ahead. So good. I've been talking. No, no, for no, a no, while, no, so no, go no, ahead. no. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think we're both thinking about the exact same quote. Cause there's so many good, good lines in it. Um, so one of the great things we have learned is not only to be tolerant of others, but to ask ourselves seriously whether the other fellow is not perhaps in the right and altogether the better man. We have learned the fundamental moral truth that no one should be judge in his own case. This, no doubt, is a symptom of a certain moral maturity, yet we may learn another lesson too well. Having discovered the sin of self-righteousness, we've fallen into its stereotyped inversion, into a stereotyped pose of self-depreciation, of my favorite two words ever uh, (laughs) from Popper, of inverted smugness. (laughs) Having learned that we should not be judge in one's own case, we are tempted to become advocates for our opponents. Thus, we become blind to our own achievements. But this tendency must be resisted. Yeah, I mean, the most galling example of this is all of the pro-Palestinian human rights student groups on the U.S. campuses, which are actively in support of Hamas, which, like, on October 8th, said that they 100% supported the Palestinian resistance. Um, and Israel was knowing. to blame. Yeah, and Israel was, yeah. was to blame. Um, and no doubt Israel has done many things incorrectly um, and have a lot of blood on their hands too, but to just jump in support of the terrorists who had murdered 800 to 1,200 people who could have been at the festival that I was just at last weekend is exactly this inverted smugness, this becoming advocates for our opponents, um, which, uh, which Popper observed in the 50s. And like Orwell notices too, like the tendency of intellectuals mm-hmm. to excuse or support the USSR and the, the Gulag. Um, and this tendency, as Popper says, must be resisted. Sometimes we are the good guys and the inability to recognize that is um, uh, quite dangerous. Um, and it was one of the things that uh, first put me at odds with the left, actually, because I was a big student of Hitchens and still am a student of Hitchens and his um, writings about the Iraq war were very persuasive to me. And when I was in this Palestinian pro-human rights group, I basically spent a year just arguing with everybody about this exact topic uh, because they were unable and unwilling to recognize that Saddam Hussein was fucking awful. Um, and the uh, apologia, apologia? No, the, no, 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 apologetics, apologetics. Apologetics, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the apologetics for totalitarianism and dictatorship uh, that I was just confronting on a daily basis and like excusing, for example, female genital mutilation because it came from brown people and we can never pass judgment as colonizers was um, was when I started to break from the, the left um, almost 12 years ago now. And yeah, so I just love that quote. Inverted smugness is such a good line. So he uses this insight that self-accusation is a unique feature of the West to as, as one of the supporting points of his fourth thesis, which is broadly the point that quote, the power of ideas, especially of moral and religious ideas is at least as important as that of physical resources. I love that. Uh, And which is a great line. And also I realized while reading it again, that yeah, it's definitely where Deutsch is getting a lot of his stuff, but also it's sort of it's it's a tr- it's it's sort of provably true as written because how to use physical resources is itself an idea, right? Mm-hmm. And so a resource is not a resource until you know what the hell to do with it. And if you're you know if it's two thousand years ago and I give you a lump of coal, that's not going to do much for you. 
Um, so it's sort of as written, it sort of proves its own worth, right? Nice, nice. So yeah, so just to wrap up the episode, we're going to kind of go quickly through the remainder of the chapter and just rattle off the remaining theses. Most of them, I think, most of the remaining ones, I think will be fairly um, familiar to the critical rationalist audience of ours. The fifth thesis is that truth is hard to come by. Um, we don't need to talk about that too much. That's vintage popper. Maybe the last thing I'll say um, is just to read one decently extended quote and then exit, which I love because I think it shows why the very simple line that truth is hard to come by is so profound. And I don't know if we've done a good job of, of explaining that particular nice. aspect yeah. of why truth is hard to come by uh, matters so much. One of the things that, that leads to one of the implications is the following. So thus we learned not only to tolerate beliefs that differ from our, o's, our own, uh, but to respect them and the men who sincerely hold them. But this means that we slowly began to differentiate between sincerity and dogmatic stubbornness or laziness and to recognize the great truth that truth is not obvious, not manifest not plainly visible to all who ardently want to see it, but hard to come by. And we learned that we must not draw authoritarian conclusions from this great truth, but on the contrary, suspect all those who claim that they are authorized to teach the truth. I love that. Um, nice. And maybe because I know you have to dash, we will leave that as the concluding thoughts for our listeners to ponder. This was a lot of fun. I got so much out of this episode. And this, uh, this essay, yeah. I always love battling with you, my man. Truth is hard to come by, right? Yeah, exactly. To be continued, right. go have fun with your other podcasts and hope, uh, <laughs> hope you have so much fun over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we'll chat right. soon, my brother. Cool. Bye. Peace.